Hi guys, welcome to video number two about the stressors of language learning. If you missed the first video, be sure to check it out. I had originally planned on only making two videos about the stressors associated with language learning. But after seeing that there was a substantial amount that could still be said, I decided to make three videos instead. In today's video, we'll talk about some of the stressors that weren't covered in the first video. We'll be covering the feeling that we're not progressing as fast as others, the feeling of intimidation at the size of our goal, the feeling that we're doing something wrong, and the feeling of boredom. And in the third and final video about language stressors, I will talk about the last two stressors. Namely, the fear of immersion itself, and perhaps the most pervasive, the general feeling of discomfort when immersing or studying flashcards. And then I will talk about some strategies that I've previously used to help deal with these stressors and stay productive. Namely, I will be talking about time boxing, dealing with individual circumstances, and a strategy that we can use to find out if language learning is even a good goal for ourselves or not. This is perhaps one of the most frustrating feelings one can have when they go about immersion learning. And it can be very easy for a learner to fall into a mindset where this deeply affects them and thus their attitude towards their own language learning. In fact, I also became quite self-conscious about my language learning abilities when I participated in a previous language learning community before we started Migaku. What happened was, in that community, there was a certain undercurrent that I personally found rather elitist. There was this idea of undervaluing people's language learning accomplishments unless they reached some arbitrary advanced levels in the language. I personally believe that the vast majority of the unique value that language learning can contribute to one's life can actually be experienced at rather modest levels of ability. I just talked about this topic in my previous video though, so if you'd like, be sure to check it out. Anyways, let's examine this feeling that other people are progressing faster than us. What are some of the big factors that contribute to one feeling this way? Well, what I might put first and foremost is the type of community that one finds themselves in. Secondly, I think one's attitude towards competition itself might play a big role here as well. So let's go ahead and talk about these two points. I know that there are some language learning communities that actually promote a sort of culture that I feel alienates a learner from their relationship with their target language. I talked about this a bit in an older video about language learning communities, which you can check out if you'd like. Although I will warn you that the video and audio quality in that video leave a lot to be desired. Also, I actually plan to remake that video in the future and go more in depth about this topic. So be sure to subscribe to the channel if that's something you'd be interested in hearing about in the future. Anyways, what seems to happen in certain communities is that participation in that community itself can take center stage and might end up serving as a distraction from what I feel a learner's true goal should be, which in my opinion is to nurture the desire that originally enticed you to start learning your target language and to continue to build a relationship with that target language. I personally believe that a person should build a very intimate relationship between themselves and their goals and should be acutely aware of whatever they allow to come between themselves and those goals. This is something I will talk about in a future video about productivity as well. But basically, I like to call this concept keeping your world small. When you keep your world small, you actively try to control the factors that could come between you and your goal. You attempt to expose yourself to provably positive factors while doing your best also to reduce exposure to what have been shown to be only negative influences. Now, I should be clear that I think engaging with a language learning community can likely be extremely beneficial for the majority of people and largely serve as a positive motivating factor. However, it is also my opinion that when one is going to engage with the language learning community, that they should at least be cognizant and thinking about how engaging with that language learning community is impacting their language learning goals and their relationship with those goals. I previously have found myself in a language learning community where the highest levels of ability were grossly glorified. This led me to second guess myself and my own abilities and realistically to undervalue my goals and even my own worth. And I feel that if you find yourself in this sort of community, the same thing could possibly happen to you. If there is a focus in only revering the highest levels of achievement that one can make in their language learning, then that sort of mentality over time can begin to seep in to one's own thinking. It can be easy to forget what you were aiming for and what you hope to achieve when you set about learning a language. A goose mentality can weave its way in between you, your life circumstances, 
and your own goals. So I believe a large part of the reason people worry themselves about their level of improvement compared to others is because of some outside factor, which for many people could possibly be the language learning communities that they're taking part in. So as I often like to say, take a step back. Think about what you wanted to achieve when you began this pursuit to begin with. Think about your own life circumstances and how you must take them into account when setting your goals. And then think about how your perspective may have been perhaps affected when you began engaging with whatever language learning communities you're engaging with. If you feel that there were any communities that ultimately didn't help you go after your goals and foster your relationship with them, then I would suggest that you think deeply about the value of engaging with that certain community. Lastly, I just want to say that there are definitely a lot of great language learning communities out there who are doing a great job at encouraging people to go after their goals and keep their relationship with those goals front and foremost. And I sincerely hope that we at Migaku will build one of the best, if not the best, language learning community out there. We are planning to systematically design our community in such a way that it will be a place where any language learner could benefit from participating, no matter their level of ability or their current goal. So guys, next time you notice yourself feeling that you might not be progressing as fast as others are, don't forget to consider what mentality those feelings are rooted in. Now, not everyone's concern about their level of progress compared to others is necessarily going to stem from them engaging with a language learning community where they overly value the highest levels of proficiency. There may be just this general mentality of competition. Now this again can have its origin in certain language learning communities, but can also stem from a person's individual character as well. For example, some people just have a propensity to enjoy competition. They may enjoy playing video games competitively or have taken part or are currently taking part in some form of competitive sports. I personally used to be decently competitive when I was younger and I found that that sort of mentality would at times leak its way into other parts of my life as well. Sometimes when you're in that mindset, it can just be as if the brain is looking for a way to be competitive all the time. Again, as I said, certain communities tend to foster this sort of mentality as well. So even if you aren't naturally competitive yourself, you might find yourself displaying these tendencies if regularly exposed to them. For example, even if you would normally not be comparing yourself to others that much, you might find that you tend to do so more often. It can definitely be a negative thing if language learning isn't your main priority, or if due to your own life circumstances, you have a smaller level of commitment than the other people in that community. The fact is that the majority of language learners have many life responsibilities and even just other activities and hobbies that are also very important to them. But what can happen is if they engage in a community with somewhat of a competitive culture, where there are many people who have language learning as a very high priority in their lives, and if the learner engaging with that community has a sort of competitive nature, they can very easily be tempted to join in and begin comparing themselves with others. Even worse, what I've seen happen is that a learner through engaging with a language learning community that is ultimately not very compatible with their own goals and their prioritization of language learning, they can begin to ask too much of themselves in a futile attempt to compete with people in the community who are currently under very different life circumstances and are devoting much more time towards their language learning. This can ultimately lead them to attempt to pursue unsustainable routes to their language learning goal and likely even lead them to eventually quit. So I would just advise you caution when it comes to adopting a competitive mentality towards your language learning, even if you are a pretty competitive person. While doing so can certainly encourage certain types of people to study more and perhaps even to stay motivated, I feel that it can be very, very easy to lose touch with why you even wanted to learn a language to begin with. Ultimately, that's what ended up happening to me over 10 years ago and why I'm so cautious when it comes to engaging with language learning communities now. So I would suggest that one one tread carefully when it comes to comparing yourself with others and ask yourself if it even makes sense to do so. Now, I'm just going to go out and say it. I feel that the act of comparing yourself with others often is just going to turn language learning into some kind of sport. Personally, I feel that the act of often comparing one's abilities with others is an act that will ultimately distract them from why they wanted to learn a language to begin with. And as I said, this is why throughout the time I was learning languages, I mostly just engaged with language learning communities to find tools and resources. Now, as I did say, I do feel that it's possible to foster a competitive mentality and through that potentially work harder on your language learning. 
After all, we humans do tend to find a way to compete in just about every facet of our lives. So I'm sure that this could happen here as well. However, the reality is that the main factor that's going to affect one's rate of progress in their language learning is simply the number of hours that they're putting in. Of course, the techniques and the ratio at which one does those techniques can surely have an impact as well. And this is an area that we at Migaku are extremely interested in gathering data into so that we can at least be able to inform people as to which activities seem to objectively be the most effective. Even considering this though, we each have different life circumstances which limit the amount of time that we can invest into our language learning. So the act of comparing your rate of progress with someone else's without some objective measure as to each of your levels of investment is unlikely to produce any meaningful data that you might find helpful in your language learning. But it is quite likely to be able to produce data which only serves to demotivate. Even if we were capable of finding someone with nearly identical life circumstances and level of investment to ourselves that are also using the same techniques at the same ratios, the data that could be found in doing this is likely to still be useless to the individual learner. For example, say we have two friends, Bob and Todd, each with no language learning history, and they're both going to learn Arabic and invest X hours, Y days a week. After one month, we find that Todd is progressing considerably faster than Bob, and that the same trend holds true for the next four months as well. Is this information actually useful to have? I mean, it could be argued that Todd might feel happy to know that perhaps he has a knack for language learning and be even more motivated to continue. While Bob, knowing the same information, will probably just feel pretty bad and only get demotivated. What if we added Steve to the equation and found out that his progress was way better than Bob and Todd's? Well, I guess both Bob and Todd would just feel pretty bad and likely get demotivated. The fact is that this data might be very valuable to gather for a company or group that is interested in learning more about effective language learning methods and what recommendations would be best to make. But for many individuals, any level of comparison is unlikely to be worth the possible motivation hit that could come from it. It is also important to recognize that research into talent seems to suggest that there is such a thing as talent when it comes to someone starting a new activity, although there is still the argument that that might just be a transference of ability from other skills. But either way, the research suggests that in the case of Bob, Todd, and Steve, that if they all continue studying in the long term, that after a couple thousand hours, whatever stark discrepancy that we were able to originally observe in their levels of ability will have nearly completely if not totally vanished. Lastly I will say that if you have concerns about whether you really are using the most effective immersion learning techniques that those concerns are definitely valid and do have a place. As I said before this is an area that we at Migaku plan to very heavily look into so that we're at a place where we're able to recommend the most effective methods while of course also recommending that a learner adjust those methods in a way that they find sustainable. Because if smashing your head against the wall was actually the best way to learn a language, but if only 1% of language learners were able to suffer the damage required to reach the finish line through that method, then it means very little at the end of the day when one's goal is to help as many people as possible reach their language learning goals. The feeling of intimidation is in some ways kind of unavoidable. Long-term goals of sufficient scale are kind of intimidating by their very nature. But only if what you're doing is thinking about the entirety of that goal. The reality is though that we're only engaging with a tiny subset of that goal on a daily basis. If you're finding this subset to still be demotivating, then you're likely asking too much of yourself. It's much better to, for the time being, scale down your daily goals and scale them up over time until you find a comfortable workload. I feel that when one has learned to focus on the tasks that lie primarily in front of them in the short term and has also become quite adept at adjusting their workload on a by need basis, that these sorts of feelings of intimidation will largely disappear. Personally, I wouldn't want the feeling of intimidation to go fully away though, as one can learn to quite enjoy it. And it is actually possible to become openly excited about being intimidated by one's goal. I feel that this type of excitement will develop naturally as one begins to be consistent about pursuing that goal and begins to believe in their own self-fulfilling prophecy. This is another feeling that is pretty prevalent, particularly among beginners in the immersion learning community. And actually, this is a feeling that is definitely valid. If you feel like you're doing something wrong and have not yet checked if what you're doing is in accordance with what successful immersion learners suggest to do or not, then I would recommend that the first thing you do is actually inquire into that. I've talked with a lot of people in the community and actually found that a lot of them were incorrectly putting into practice a lot of the advice that 
is commonly suggested immersion learners follow. This was usually because they either misunderstood what to do or because clear information about what to do was not readily available. Immersion learning is still in its infancy and there's a long way to go when it comes to finding clear, concise guidelines about how to carry it out. However, we at Migaku are currently building a team and starting to work on a comprehensive website that will clearly outline every step of the process. So be sure to subscribe to the channel if you're interested in hearing about that project as new developments are made. When confirming whether what you're doing is wrong or not, I recommend you follow the advice of someone who has succeeded with immersion learning because this greatly raises your chance of receiving helpful advice. If at the time you're watching this video, the Migaku website is not currently yet finished, then I recommend perhaps entering an immersion learning community and seeking advice there. Again, trying to make sure to seek advice, particularly from advanced learners, when it comes to the actual technicalities of the techniques used. I also recommend that you watch the listening, reading, and SRS episodes of my How to Immerse in a Foreign Language series because that video shows you how to go about actually applying some of the techniques that I found so helpful in my own language learning. You can of course watch videos or read articles from other successful immersion learners as well. So after you've checked if what you were doing was correct or not and adjusted your techniques if needed and you're still having the feeling that you might be doing something wrong, then I'm afraid it might take you beginning Beginning to notice your steady progress, to start to be confident that you know what you're doing and for some of your anxiety to be put at ease. Another point I want to say is that it can be very easy to start feeling discouraged if you feel you're doing something wrong. But we must acknowledge that whenever we're doing anything new, it's very common to run across these sorts of feelings. For example, and let me use a bit of an extreme example here just for fun. Say I was going to be trying bungee jumping or skydiving today for the first time. As you could imagine, I would definitely feel a great deal of anxiety about whether I was doing something wrong or not particularly because I would feel like my life was on the line. And I actually feel that the feeling of anxiety about doing something wrong in this scenario is actually very similar to the one one has when language learning. Because one is afraid that they are wasting their time and perhaps admittedly on a lesser scale that their life is also on the line. So anyways, just remember that it will most likely take you building personal experience to fully put your concerns at rest. So the best thing you can try to do is to be consistent and wait for the results to show you the efficacy of the methods. No matter which immersion learning method you currently follow, we must remember that none of them have been refined into the best possible way to go about learning a language. That's the stage where all immersion learning methods currently are, as no one has yet recorded a data long term that can definitively show that their recommended methodologies are ultimately better than others. What we do know, however, is that in the immersion learning space, there are methods that have led people to comfortable levels of fluency. So for the time being, while we don't have the ultimate immersion learning method figured out, I would suggest resisting the temptation to continuously method shop which is wasting way too much time comparing and contrasting methods. I've known many people in the community who have done this and regret having done so. Remember, there is no perfect immersion learning method. So I feel that as long as you're making sure to follow the advice of those who have had success in their immersion learning and have found techniques that are sustainable in your own life, that then it's probably safe to stop second guessing whether you're doing something wrong or not and just focus on your studies. Now, the feeling of boredom is actually a pretty complex problem, so let's get straight into it and break it down. I basically see boredom as stemming from three different main causes. One, boredom due to not enjoying specific immersion learning activities. Two, boredom due to a lack of ability and comprehension. Three, boredom due to lack of interest in the content itself. This boredom stems from lack of enjoyment of actual immersion learning activities. For example, say a learner named Jessie who is just beginning her first language did not spend much time previously watching TV shows or movies or reading and that she really doesn't enjoy spending her time that way very much. Perhaps she prefers to spend her time playing video games or maybe watching and playing sports. But one day she hears about immersion learning and decides she wants to use it to learn French. Let's also say that Jessie doesn't have much free time. Say that she only has two hours on most days and usually for one hour of that time she spends it playing video games and spends the other hour either watching or playing sports. Then let's say she decides to put about half of her free time into her immersion learning. 
Well, suddenly we can see that Jessie is committing to spend a considerable amount of her free time doing activities that she's historically not been a big fan of. She's actually interested in French because she wants to go to a tennis school there in a few years and learn from a famous instructor there. Well, the reality for Jessie here is that immersion learning is going to require certain kinds of activities. Unfortunately, those activities are not always going to be one's favorites. And the required amount of discipline in doing immersion learning activities will vary wildly from person to person. As I will tell you in a bit, I am personally not a huge fan of fiction books or television. And before starting immersion learning with Japanese, I rarely consumed fiction content. I had to use a lot of discipline when immersing with fiction content. And I'm speaking from experience when I say that unfortunately for a person like Jessie, it's going to be a little bit more difficult for her to pursue to immersion learning and it's going to require substantially more discipline from her than it would for someone who is learning Japanese and is an avid fan of anime for example or someone who is learning Korean and loves K-dramas. A person like that would have a lot more intrinsic motivation to watch shows in their target language whereas Jessie would in reality just prefer to go outside and practice her tennis swing. Well this is exactly what I was talking about in my previous video when I said that goals require sacrifices and the payment of an opportunity cost. Jessie knows that if she learns French and goes to France to practice tennis, that she will surely have a great time and meet a lot of new friends. She's quite social and really looking forward to her time in France. But here she is now, facing activities that she really doesn't like all that much, standing between her and her living her best life in France. At the end of the day, Jessie is going to have to make the choice here about what she wants to do and about whether she thinks her discipline will be up to the task of doing what she needs to do to acquire French. She can of course use mitigating techniques like time boxing, which we'll talk about in the next video, and that certainly might make the process a lot more enjoyable for her. She may also try to watch a lot of tennis related content and even switch to that kind of content at a given interval to try to help herself stay motivated. Or she could even try to find a language learning buddy to do her immersion with, which might make the process a lot more enjoyable as well. But at the end of the day, Jessie will need to read and listen to French for many hours in order to acquire it to a high level. Hopefully, through a bit of curious trial and error, she is able to find a way to do so that is not only sustainable, but that she begins to enjoy over time. Now, this is one that I personally think almost all of us face. Suddenly being rushed back to understanding the world at the level of a very young child is jarring to say the least. In fact, this is a part of the process that I personally get really, really bored by. And the way that I found to get around this that works for me is by front loading the study of grammar and vocabulary in an SRS. I do this in a strategic way, studying the most common words that make up 80 to 85% of a language in frequency order. And also study the grammar patterns that make up 95% or more of that language. While I do this, I continue to immerse, but I'm able to maintain a high degree of motivation. Due to the knowledge that I am strategically putting myself in the best place possible, to begin to understand large swaths of my immersion content in the near future. However, this is by no means a solution to the problem. As even when someone has finished this initial study, they are basically just past the starting line when it comes to acquiring their target language. And still will be understanding that language at a comfortable level for some time to come. But for me personally, I feel that this strategy is like the key that opens a language for me. After I follow this strategy, I can understand 80% or more of the words I come across. And suddenly I feel that the process becomes a lot more enjoyable for me because I can finally just be curious in the language. As that is the point when I finally become able to start understanding interesting messages. And as I've said before in previous videos, one must change their mindset when it comes to immersing in their target language. If one is expecting the activity to resemble either watching a show or reading a book in your native language, then they are sure to find the activity rather boring, even if they are starting to understand around 80% of the words that they see. Because even when understanding around 80% of words, you still can't really grasp what's going on. And in the future, I'll be making a video about what I feel is probably a much better way to measure understanding than just counting the percentage of words that they know in a given piece of content. But anyways, even when someone is understanding around 80% of the words in their immersion content, they still must change their mindset about what reasonable expectations and goals should be when immersing in their target language. One's goal should simply be to increase their knowledge of their target language through exposure to it when immersing. As I've said in previous videos, your goal is definitely not to try to understand the entirety of the content. That will come with time. 
What you should do is do your best to muster a childlike curiosity about the language itself. But ultimately, I do think that this is probably the most challenging part of the language learning process for me. And if you're also someone who has a lot of trouble in this area, I recommend you watch my How to Immerse in a Foreign Language listening video. In it, I outline some different levels of attention of engaging with your immersion content which should help you stay more engaged in it and I think personally can make the process a lot more fun. For example, one strategy that I've been using myself that seems to help me stay way more engaged when I'm still a beginner in a language is the time box switching between native language subtitles and target language subtitles at a given interval. And while I do think it's important to start immersing early in the process and to begin to get used to the sounds in your target language, and more importantly, to start building the habit of regularly interacting with your target language that you will need to have in order to successfully enter and eventually complete the sentence and vocabulary mining part of the process. I do feel that for some people, starting immersion very early is probably very difficult. And for those people, I really just recommend using native language subtitles for the majority of their immersion time when they're just starting off. And perhaps if you're a person who really doesn't mind the SRS too much, it's probably not a terrible idea to go ahead and do a bit more SRSing at the beginning to more quickly introduce yourself to the basic structure of your target language. I personally think that there's a decent amount of variability here as to what an individual learner can tolerate. I really recommend that you individually feel out what approach seems to work best for you and allows you to feel positively about what you're doing. This can be another big problem, particularly depending on the language you're learning and also depending on the languages that you already know. If you're a native speaker of a language that isn't spoken by very many people, say Icelandic for example, which is only spoken by around 350,000 people. And I actually have a friend from Iceland and his English is at a native level and he actually speaks it better than he does Icelandic. Because as he says, the amount and variety of content in English absolutely dwarfs that of content in Icelandic. So if you're coming from a language like that and learning a language that's spoken by many, many people, then of course it's very easy to find a wide variety of content that you're likely going to be interested in. However, if you're learning a language that has a rather modest number of native speakers in comparison to your native language or some of the other languages that you know, you may find that the amount and variety of content in your target language feels rather limited in comparison. When I dabbled in Icelandic and Latvian, I definitely felt a huge disparity between the amount of content available in English, Japanese, Chinese, and even Portuguese in comparison to those two languages, for example. Along with your target language having potentially a lot less total content and just less variety of content, another factor and one that is maybe difficult to bring up is that of a difference in culture. The fact is that the type of content put out by certain cultural spheres may simply just not be as appealing to you as content put out in your native language or some of the other languages that you speak. For example, a common distinction being the difference between American humor, the humor in Eastern Europe, or even the humor of the Far East. There may simply just be some distinct cultural differences between speakers of your target language and speakers of your native language. And one will just have to accept that they're not going to like a lot of the content that they come across in their target language much the same way you're not going to like a lot of the content that you come across in your native language or another language that you speak. But I feel that the, usually this is more of a problem of people not being systematic about regularly looking for new interesting content. So when it comes to the issue of finding content that you enjoy, I recommend that you, one, try to keep some sort of immersion content log. Making sure to at least haphazardly organize all the YouTube channels, videos, TV shows, books, and other target language content that you've enjoyed. If you at least save the names and links to them, it will make it a lot easier to return to them in the future and also to search for content similar to them later on as well. Two, on some given interval, dabble in new content with the goal of finding something new that interests you. Three, 
be willing to spend money. Sometimes the best way to get access to the type of content you want is to simply pay for it. If there's a book or a film that seems interesting and you can afford it without trouble and can't gain access to it in any other way, then I highly suggest you consider purchasing it and investing in your language learning journey. It makes very little sense to be willing to invest potentially thousands of hours of your life into a goal and not be willing to spend money to facilitate your progress in that goal. And lastly, just to elaborate a little further on dabbling in new content. I feel that what one should do at times is pick a few days or even perhaps a week and for that period of time simply have sampling a lot of different content in your target language as your goal. I would likely even recommend stopping the study of new flashcards during this time as well. Finding new content is actually an extremely important part of the process and should be treated as such. As the more anchors that you set down in the proverbial sea of your target language's content, the higher the chance that you build a sustainable habit that you can see through to the end of reaching your language learning goals. <music> Lastly, I just want to touch that different parts of the immersion learning process are going to require different ratios of inherent interest and discipline from each individual learner. And even for the same given learner, the same activities will require different ratios of discipline and inherent interest on different days, based on how you're feeling that day or how interested you are in the particular content you're consuming then. As I mentioned earlier, before I started learning Japanese, the vast majority of media that I consumed in English was non-fiction, mostly documentaries and lectures. But when I decided to start learning Japanese, I decided that I really want to learn more about Japan and its people, and therefore wanted to immerse myself in normal Japanese popular culture, which is what I ended up doing, but as a result, my immersion often required more discipline than it may otherwise have. I leaned heavily on time boxing as a strategy that allowed me to stay engaged, even when I was otherwise not overly interested in the content I was consuming. I really feel that if you find a lot of the immersion learning techniques require considerable discipline to accomplish, that time boxing can and likely will help alleviate some of the pressure of that. But I'll be talking about time boxing in the very next video though, so be sure to subscribe if you're interested in hearing more about it. So remember just to be aware of those activities that require more discipline from you, and be willing to think about some strategies that might help you to mitigate the stress that comes along when doing those particular activities. Before we go, I just want to tell you the story of my Moroccan friend who I met in China. Today we can just call him Ahmed, and how he was able to apply immersion learning to learn Chinese to an incredibly high level while outputting from day one. My friend found that for him, a lot of immersion learning techniques required a lot of discipline for him to carry out, and that he would have trouble with lack of motivation. He was quite a gregarious type and loved hanging out and being social, and found that only when he was able to be social very regularly would he have the motivation to continue his studies and particularly his SRS reviews. So what he did was deliberately decide to go ahead and socialize as much as possible. He was actually an international student there, and let's just say he was very liberal about attending classes. Anyways, even I hung out with his group of Chinese friends a few times with him. And let's just say that my friend straight up befriended a Chinese mob in our town. I don't know exactly what kind of shady stuff they were doing, but I'm sure it probably wasn't good. And I'm not talking about my friend anyways, I'm talking about his friends. But hanging out with them was definitely a good time to say the least. So anyways, Ahmed was basically hanging out with the Chinese mob for many hours a day, basically every day. And when he wasn't, he was highly motivated to continue his studies. When he wasn't hungover, of course. Hanging out with his group of mobster friends greatly motivated him to stay focused on his studies. And Ahmed actually went on to become the best foreign speaker of Mandarin that I've ever personally met. And he was always mistaken for a native speaker from a western region of China when we went out together. And he wasn't even asked for his passport at hotels, he would be asked for his Chinese identification card. Maybe one day I'll try to invite him to the channel and do an interview with him if he'd be up for it. And maybe one day I'll also make a video about how the town I lived in in China, there was a group of the Chinese mob who befriended a lot of the foreigners there. But basically, the most important point I want to make today is that you have to find something you can stick to. I would highly advise against trying to prioritize any rigid guidelines that might just eventually lead you to quit and always prioritize sustainability over efficiency if you ever find yourself considering between the two. Well, that's it for today, guys. And while I'm sure I could talk a lot more about the intricacies 
and nuances about all the stressors that we face. There simply isn't the time to do so and I highly doubt most of you would wanna hear me do that anyways. In the next and final video about language learning stress, I'm going to be talking about the last two big stressors that I see a lot of people come across. One being the fear of immersion itself and the other being the general feeling of discomfort one likely feels when studying their target language. And I will also cover time boxing and other strategies that might help you better fit immersion learning into your life. I know the videos in this how to immerse in a foreign language series are quite long guys. But after this series is over, I plan on having a much better breakdown between short form videos, medium form videos, and long form videos. Anyways, if you're interested in helping us decide the direction of Migaku, joining our official Migaku Discord community, and gaining access to early releases of Migaku software and other bonus content, then please consider supporting Migaku on Patreon. As always, thank you so much to all my patrons. I couldn't do it without your support. And of course, a special shout out to the $1 leech tier. My heart is nearly bursting with gratitude to my leeches. Thank you so much. If you need support with an issue you're having or would like to join the Immerse With Me Gaku Reddit community, you can find those links in the description below. If you would like a chance to win free special VIP access to the official Migaku Discord community and to Migaku software projects, then please subscribe to this channel and leave a like and comment on this video. At the end of every month, I choose 10 people to get a free behind the scenes look at the community we're building. And that number will be increasing as new Patreon milestones are reached. As always, thank you so much for watching and I hope you found some value in today's video. See ya.